Today's scripture can be found on page 850 of the Pew Bibles in front of you if you'd like to follow along. Uh, it is, it is uh, two of Jesus' parables, the parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin. It's from Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep. Just so, I tell you, there will be many more, more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having 10 silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who rep repents. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank Thanks be to God. God.
Amen. Well, church, you know, uh, I'm not naturally a people person. I don't know if you picked up on that yet or not. <laughs> I'm more of a, a project person is what I've found. I got to have a project or a plan or a book or just something. And I remember back before I was preaching every week, back way back in seminary, I was working at a church and uh, I was walking in behind a group of people. Well, they picked up the bulletin. They saw my name was on the docket to preach that day. I overheard this. They said, Nick's preaching. We're going to really learn something today, whether we like it or not. <laughs> you know, it's not that, that I don't like <laughs> John said amen to that. <laughs> it's not that I don't like people. You know, it's just not, I'm not good at small talk. That is not a gift that I have received. Uh, I love you. More importantly, God loves you. But you got to understand, I'm not going to be your person for small talk or chit chat. If I'm talking to you, there's, there's a point, there's probably bullet points and action items attached. <laughs> and that's actually a big part of why I got into ministry. You know, I don't think I've shared this, but uh, previously, as you all know, I was a science guy. I worked in a lab and all of that. Uh, but a number of factors just turned me around and led me to ministry. And one of the biggest of those factors was I saw a Disciples of Christ Church that was just starting to become like a well-oiled machine, and I wanted to take part in that. I wanted to do something like that. And so often we, uh, we want something fresh or new, and we try to reinvent the wheel, and instead this church that I saw, it just got really good. It got good at a level that is in incredible. It had a much more significant reach in missions and outreach and membership, and all of that was just because science types you know, sort of your project people got at it and worked out all the nonsense. And so all of a sudden, you know, it, it was amazing to see at that church because Sunday school teachers, people who should be people persons, they got all the, the hard work and the lesson plans and the like worked out, and then they just got to be there with those kids and really make an impact. You saw people doing missions. They didn't have to do part-time missions and part-time you know, working out the finances or anything like that. They just got to get after a mission. So it was awesome. You know, and I, I found out that that's what I want to do, just organize a church to operate at a level that it hasn't operated before. And I got to say, you know, I may be a little biased, but I think that's the way to go. I think churches need more of that. But I also know that that means I have room to grow into who Jesus is. See, one of the things that Jesus taught and did and lived out that made him not the norm at all was his approach to people. He was very much a people person. He was always centered on people to an extent that it continually challenges me. See, for Jesus, it, it was never stuff. It was never money. It was never prestige or respect or success. It, it even wasn't pragmatics or getting the job done. Jesus, he was wildly non-pragmatic because for him, it was always about people. Plain and simple, Jesus loves people. And loving people well, much to my chagrin, that just isn't something that you can program or plan. You know, you can do the right things. You can set up times like, say, an ice cream social where there's probably going to be a lot of people loving people, but you just can't fit loving people well into an Excel file. Trust me, I've tried. In fact, Jesus, his, his tenacity to set everything aside and just make the whole day about loving someone well, that's really what got him in so much trouble with the Pharisees to begin with. See, the Pharisees, they, they were concerned with the Old Testament law, and they were concerned with the law not just because they really liked Bible studies, but because they were concerned with building back Israel in the way they saw fit. To the Pharisees, it was like they had their perfect system and they had everything lined out and they knew a five-year plan of how everything's going to go. If only everyone agreed with them, they could make it all right. And so you can imagine they became incredibly frustrated whenever Jesus started to come around. See, Jesus, he would 
relativize the law. You all know those stories. It's a, you can heal, you can feed people, you can do things on the Sabbath. Of course you can. People need it. You would tell the Pharisees all their laws and all their rules. They were supposed to be for people, not people for the laws. That angered them incredibly. But even more so, the Pharisees, they were mad at Jesus because he was talking about building up the kingdom of God, and, and yet he had no plan for overthrowing Rome or making sure Israel succeeded. He had a whole different idea entirely. He just spent his days loving people well. And that was his whole agenda, love folks well. He was going to build up the kingdom, not through a bunch of laws, not through a bunch of programs, not any sort of good ideas, but by each of us just turning our love on, by each of us just letting ourselves shine for every last person to see. And again, y'all got to understand, I, that's something that challenges me and inspires me constantly. I never have a day where I don't think that's just the, the hardest and most beautiful thing that you could do with a life. Love folks well. Just make that your whole agenda. It's one of those things about Jesus that, that is just so different to all of us. Like here, here Jesus is taking charge. He's issuing a command to the Pharisees on what faithful people should be like. And it's something that makes a ton of sense for Jesus, but we just don't do it. Like he says to us, he says, which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? Of course, the answer is, which one of us? None of us. No one does this. Nobody does this. Nobody would ever do this. If you lose one percent of your flock, you don't risk ninety-nine percent of your flock trying to get the one back. You just don't. That'd be silly. But he says again, What woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it, and when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the lost coin. Which one of you would do this? Again, the answer is, none of us. None of us would do that. I know for myself, whenever I lose something, it's just lost. Like someday, if I'm going to move someday, first of all, I'm pretty sure the couch is just staying there because it's a pull-out couch, and I'm not fooling with that again. But <laughs> if I were to move the pull-out couch, I'm sure there's going to be a treasure trove under there, but until then, it's just lost. It's just game over. It's down there, and it's not going anywhere. But if I were to move it, and I were to find one coin, you know what I certainly wouldn't do? I wouldn't take that one coin and then go out and spend about 20, maybe 30 coins on a celebration that I found the one coin. You see how silly that is? Do you see we don't do this sort of thing? You don't call your friends, you don't call your neighbors together for a big party to celebrate and spend more money on the one coin you found do you see what I'm saying? Do you see what I'm getting at? She's blowing about, I presume, probably 20 bucks, 30 bucks if she's trying to be impressive, over one coin, one buck. Nobody does this. Nobody except Jesus does this. And that's why he's front and center, of course. You know, that's why walking with him is the gospel, the good news. Jesus, he's, he's of course, not really talking about coins and sheep. He's talking about God's will that he lives out personally. And God's will is always searching, always seeking out, always bring people into a loving, caring community that walks together through every season of life. And it doesn't make sense to us. It's not what we naturally do. But that's who God is. God puts all his effort into the one lost sheep, not the 99 who are doing just fine. And again, that's good news because we've all had a time when we've been the one lost sheep, when we've been the one lost coin. Whatever lost looked like for you, we've all been there. And so we get it, even if we don't really do it. You see, what this story teaches and what it cautions us on 
is to not get wrapped up in any project or idea or friend group or anything else that you miss sight of the most important thing. And the most important thing to God and to Jesus is people. It's, it's so simple, it's, it's hard to do. The most important thing to God and to Jesus is people. And specifically, whoever those people are who aren't yet included, that's the most important thing to God. Loving them well, making sure they're gathered around the table with us. We all need other people. We're all going to have times when we need someone we can call or go see a movie with or whatever it is. Other people are an invaluable resource. We even know that people with a good friend group, they tend to live longer. They tend to be healthier. You can feel it in your body, our need for other people. And yet we can get stuck when it comes to other people. See, what I can find myself doing, if I'm not careful, is falling into a rut where it's all about me and my plans. And even if they're good plans, even if they're plans for the sake of other people, what I can start to do is re-understand the whole world according to my plans. All of a sudden, my plans are the most important thing, not the people they're supposed to be serving, you see? And what happens is every person quickly becomes someone who gets it or someone who just doesn't get it. Everyone is either helping or they're getting in the way, that sort of thing. And pretty soon what I've made for myself is a tight-knit group of friends who get it, who are on my side, that sort of thing, but who rarely reach out. And I think that's something we all do. You know, we go from being the lost sheep to finding the group of people who just get it. When you find that group of people, it's like, finally, yes, these people get it. And then those people, they're, they're, they're helping us and they're understanding us and they're the exact type of folk we naturally like to spend time with. And what can happen is, while that's good, what can happen is that we quickly lose interest in seeking out that one more person. When we stop being that, that one lost sheep, when we return to the fold, we, we forget that there are people outside the fold to begin with sometimes. Just beneath the surface, what's going on there is we all have the temptation to form our own little pharisaical club where all the quote-unquote good people or smart people or right people are already in and everyone else, everyone outside of our group, they quickly become a, a quote-unquote sinner, someone who just doesn't get it, someone who's just not acting right, someone who, for whatever reason, they're not a part of us and that must be on them. What Jesus is reminding us of here is that the people not yet included are the most important thing. No one we encounter in life, no one will ever be someone who is unloved by God. No one is out of reach. In fact, the people who seem most distant from us, the people that seem like they wouldn't fit in with us, they're probably the people that God is most at work with and who would, whose presence would be the most blessing to us if we were to interact with them. You know, we're working to be more of a missional church here as things get back up and going, as we get onto the other side of COVID. And that's something that, of course, doesn't happen overnight. It takes some time. It takes some planning, all of that. And so we'll hear more on the focus of God's mission found in Jesus over the course of the next couple of weeks. But for today, I just want us to pause and I want us to hold on to the simplicity and the beauty of putting people first. Because that's actually the biggest part of our mission. It's just that that's the one part that we can't schedule or structure or build up with anything fancy. We just got to, each of us, individually do it and do it from, from the heart. The most important person in our mission is always the next person the person not yet included at the table, whoever it is that isn't a part of our group, whoever it is that just doesn't get our plans and what we do here and so on, those are the most important people. What that means for us is that there's no direction the church could go in. There is no program, no ministry, no pastor, no, no nothing that can replace things like just giving someone a call, saying, hey, I've missed you. 
Hey, I'm just checking up. How are you doing? There's nothing that replaces that. There's nothing that outdoes just stopping, taking 10 minutes and saying, I'm sure the next people I see are going to be mad I'm late, but right now I just want to see how you're doing. Nothing replaces that. Things like taking folks out to lunch, bringing a casserole to people who, who are going through hard times. Understand, none of that is stuff that, that I can plug into an Excel file or make perfect for us. That's just something that we naturally do, and, and it's to be commended. Prioritizing that next person, the one outside of our group, that's always going to be the most important thing. You know, one of the biggest ways we can impact people's lives, that we can be representatives and workers for Jesus' kingdom, is found in our willingness to put aside us being right or us having a plan or us doing what us and 98 other people think is right. Oddly enough, the biggest mission laid out in the Bible, the biggest thing we can do is sometimes to just stop and not make it about us or our stuff or our friend group or our plans or whatever it may be, but just routinely stopping and making life more about just chasing down that one lost sheep, but throwing a party over that one lost coin. Nothing we do now and nothing we could ever do as a church could ever replace putting the next person first. May it be so.